Welcome to the What Paramedics Want podcast series of Inside EMS, sponsored by Pulsera. Whether replacing radio reports, alerting specialty teams, or managing mass casualty incidents, Pulsera simplifies communication one tool every day, regardless of the event. Well, this is time for another crossover edition of whichever podcast you wish to call us this week. I'm Rob Lawrence, and sitting on one side of me is... Chris Subalero. How are you doing, everyone? And so we are live in the speaker ready room, although we'll discuss ready in a second, but we're in the speaker room here at EMS World Expo in Las Vegas, and it's good to be here again, Chris. Yeah, I got to tell you, Rob, I mean, every year it seems that the conference really just grows and grows. And one of the things that I think I find interesting this year is that the level of new people that are here, right? I mean, people are really coming to the conference for the first time. And I think that one of the things that's really good about that is we're getting old, you know, and we have to be able now to develop the next generation of EMS leaders. And I think as we take that on... A lot of people will be intimidated by that, but I think it's a fun journey because yep. we get to pass the torch of something that we've loved for so long, and people finally need to wheel us around in the wheelchair for a while. Absolutely right. And actually, after the break, you're going to be interviewing Tracy Loscar, who's I one am. of the judges at Stand and Deliver this That's year. That's right. I'm excited so, about it. But talking of not new people, and uh, sitting next to me on this side is none other than Dr. Ray Barashansky, who's just jetted in from the other side of the world. Welcome, Ray, and this is the EMS One Stop and Inside EMS Crossover Podcast here at EMS World Expo. Welcome to back. Welcome back to the United States. What are you going to be talking about? So I'm going to be doing two presentations. Today, I'm doing a presentation about speaking at EMS conferences, and it's called Don't Just Read the Slides. And almost what Chris was saying about bringing people who have great ideas and great energy and saying to them, you can do this. You can be up there speaking and trying to give them a roadmap based on my experiences, things I've had to learn, the good, the bad, the ugly, about getting them up there and getting them ready to speak. And then tomorrow I'm discussing emotional intelligence and how it really impacts EMS supervisors, managers, and leaders. I've always had a great time at Expo, and I feel like this year, Chris, you had a great point. Lots of new people. I actually have to compliment um, Kevin Colopy and Sean Kivlihan. I feel like there's a lot of energy around stand and deliver, and I think that that's really, uh, the idea is excellent, and they've taken it, and they've really run with it. So it's a great idea, and they've done great things with it as well. But yeah, the energy here is exceptional. And great to talk so about. we don't want to steal the thunder of, of Chris's interview next, but ugly, he mentioned that, there you are. But uh, we, we talk about Ray a lot, actually, when, when we do both of our various podcasts, because of course, we're going to talk about you for a second, but the consummate edutainer, and I think that's what you need when you deliver a conference session, right? You know, I think that one of the things that's really important is, we were just kind of talking about this before you shove these microphones in our hand, uh, Rob, but one of the things that I think is important is how we interpret... I never miss the chance of an interview. That's right. When they were talking, I'm like, oh, this is a great podcast, vodcast, let's do it. Carry on. Yeah, but I think that one of the things that we were talking about is I teach emotional intelligence as well. And when we think about my class compared to what Ray is going to teach, we want to be able to have someone else's interpretation of science. One of the things that we don't do well enough in EMS is we don't grow off each other's experiences. And we almost take a little bit of, you know, we get defensive when we see these things happen, right? Yeah. But, you know, the way I start an IV is not the way you're going to start an IV. The way that I intubate someone is not the way you're going to intubate someone. The way that I talk about leadership isn't the way that you guys talk about leadership. We really need to be able to understand that there are different perspectives of the topics that we teach and we need to be able to embrace those because I may say you know what the way that Ray does his discussion of emotional intelligence maybe I've been wrong this whole time the way that you talk about you know how to whatever it is I need to be able to take that and say he's just so wrong that I'm not even going to put that in my presentations but if we're not learning from each other if we're not growing from each other what we're doing is we're keeping ourselves silo and I think that that's one of the problems that keeps EMS from growing is that we're in our own little pod in our own little world we got to get out Rob you know we got to get out of that great so 
we t- I'd say we talk about you, right? And so when you are, and you lecture to full classrooms, standing room only, I've been one of the people standing, you know, you, you, he's an amazing speaker, right? Without a doubt. He pays but people to come to his lectures, Rob. We well, can't talk about paying people to oh, come no, to, we come to oh, we, no, 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 I, go, I don't stop, know that for a fact. Rewind, yeah, rewind. Yeah, yeah. And they leave early. Anyway, <laughs> look, move, moving on. No, no, but yeah, of yeah. course, what is the trick to holding the audience when you're a speaker? I think you have to be very real with your audience. I think you have to bring your experiences and you have to deliver them over, not just reading the slides behind you, but literally telling your audience, this is what I went through, this is how I handled it, you may handle it differently, I want you to learn from me. And that's just it. When Just now when Chris was talking about how we might approach leadership topics in a different way, that's because we all bring those accumulated experiences. And as I said to Chris before, it might be the experience, it might be even your education, it could be somebody who mentored you and the way that impacted you. And I try to bring all of that experience, all those positions, all of those interactions to my, cl- to my classes. Yeah. Great. I'm going to change change tack for a second because I've got you sitting here. You've just uh, authored a pretty uh, hard-hitting uh, editorial um, op-ed and uh, talking about EMS as an essential service. I think it's something we all agree with, but uh, what points did you make? So there were literally the reason I put the article out there, and it was in Governing Magazine, and the reason I put the article out there is because I've heard so much in the echo chamber that is EMS, and whether that's in the EMS social media posts or other things EMS specific about EMS as an essential service, and I realized we have to elevate the discussion. We have to elevate the conversation. We have to go to governmental decision makers and policy makers and elected officials and stop with the EMS echo chamber and say, you all need to pay attention to this because this is impacting you. If you look at the newspaper, look at newspapers, look at magazine articles, every day a different state is saying that their EMS system is in crisis. Last week I saw it was New Jersey. The week before that I think it was Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Every week there's a different state. And so what I was trying to do was take it and say forget about the EMS echo chamber for just a moment, which it, and that echo chamber is important, but forget it for just a moment. We need to elevate the conversation to governmental decision makers. And the secondary purpose was to make sure that those decision makers know that the essential service, the being designated an essential service needs to come with form, function, and funding. If it does not come with those three things, it's a hollow designation. It is going to do nothing. It's going to be words on a piece of paper, and it's not going to benefit the EMS system it's not going to benefit their constituents and it's not going to benefit citizens so those were my two major goals i will take this moment to give props to doug wolfberg who was the person i sent my article to and asked him to read through it before it actually went for publication but yeah it was that was that's it Great. I mean, good job, but Doug, Doug is a sage and obviously gave, gave you some, some great advice. So, first of all, there's a call to action here that no matter what association you're in, legislate, advocate, be present, whether it's the local, the state or the federal level. My biggest concern, though, about having EMS as essential service, Ray, is that once you get that designation in some states, are we still paying lip service? Yeah, we've got it. Stamp done and then it's game over you know, because of course what we what we think we mean by essential services it's fully funded and everyone's recruited and it's all hunky dory but it's not unfortunately you're totally correct which is why articles like that and the conversations that come from them are only the beginning so it's we have so many EMS experts. We really do. We have people who've been in it. They've moved from EMT and paramedic to state EMS directors and so on. So taking that article and using it as your conversation starting point is really what I want for people to say, again, that form, function, yep. and funding. I want people to go to those decision makers and say, this is what we need to do. Because look at it, Colorado, liquor stores are an essential service. EMS isn't. Okay. There's nobody in the world who would not look at that fact and go, mm-hmm. okay, that's crazy. And now another fact, even states that have it as an essential service, Pennsylvania is one good example. There's no clarifying language that goes along with it. So it's simply that it's an essential service. We can't have that. So not only do we need to have it as an essential service, we need it very clear in statute what that means. Who's going to be delivering the service? The governmental entity how they're going to be delivering it, even if it's a different way than yeah. expected. We need that minutiae. So it, this, is, this article was literally a conversation starter. 
Great. So thank you very much, uh, Ray. When we come back, Chris is going to be talking to Tracy Loscar about the Stand and Deliver programme. But before we go to break, please make sure you like and subscribe on the platform wherever you get your podcast or indeed your video. Don't forget, not only are we on all of the audio podcasts, we're also on YouTube. So go and visit the EMS One channel, right, Chris? Exactly and you right. can you can actually see us as well as hear us. There's a discussion about whether people want to actually see us, but yeah. there we go. And now a word from our sponsor. Pulsera scales to beat your dynamic communication needs. From routine patient alerts to managing large-scale emergencies, every responder and clinician connects seamlessly. Familiar yet powerful, Pulsera streamlines your response from routine transfers to regional disasters. It's one tool every day, regardless of the event. Discover more at Pulsera.com. And here we are, we're back here with Tracy Loscar, one of our friends, one of our colleagues, an EMS One columnist, an all-around great person. So Tracy, I'm glad to talk to you, glad to have you back. Let's talk about Stand and Deliver. Give us a little bit about what this is and uh, how you're kind of changing the world with this program. All right, Stand and Deliver is the brainchild of Sean Kivelhan and Kevin Colopy. I think we're in our sixth year, so it might be seventh year at this point, and it's kind of a version of The Voice or America's Got Talent for finding the next best national speaker. It's looking for the next generation of EMS speakers. Uh, it's looking for the next latest and greatest, trying to find someone else who's going to get up to the front of the room. We see this all the time yeah. of... Uh, people saying, I could never do that. And the reality is that they could. Uh, it's uh, uh, an opportunity for people to get up and get real-time feedback. Yeah. So they created this program where they created this program where people sign up for a 15-minute slot and they can talk about any topic that they want. They present it in a professional format to a panel of national speakers. And there are some parameters. And at the end of that time, they get feedback from all of those speakers. They're judged on a rubric and point system. And at the end of the conference, the winner presents a second time, having incorporated the feedback from the judges. And the winner of the overall conference gets to come back the following year and present on that topic with a guaranteed slot for EMS World. I got to tell you, I mean, such a great program. And, you know, when I first started speaking, I, I just was a wreck, right? I yeah. mean, I, I, I didn't have any feedback. And, yeah. you know, it, it's all about mistake. It's all about failure. It's all about reflection. It's all about growth. But if people want to get involved in the program, what's the best way that they can do that? Or even before we get there, let me ask you this. For this year, how many people did you have apply that are going to be delivering presentations uh, for you and the team? Um, I don't have the exact number. I think there were 24. It's either 20 or 24 slots. Okay. It, it fills up pretty rapidly. I believe we filled up within three days. So does so. everybody have the opportunity to do it, or you're just in a certain slot, or you only pick X amount of people? Who it's it? first come, first serve. Okay. And so anybody, anybody can apply, any background. It's open to absolutely anyone with any experience. All right, so let's go ahead and go back to the initial question then. If people are interested, they're saying this, they want to get involved with this next year, what's the best way they can do that? Uh, monitor the website. As soon as it's open, uh, they'll see advertisement for Stand and Deliver. And all they have to do is sign up for a time slot that works for them. Do you look for um, national speakers to help with this as well, to help uh, as judges? and Or are you guys pretty well set on the team that you have? Absolutely. Kevin and Sean usually put out a call for people who want to judge awesome. in advance. And I think this is a great opportunity. I mean, you're always wondering, what's the best way that I can get into the national conference? And I think that one of the things that you really need to be able to do is, and I, we were kind of talking about this before in the last segment, where we've got to be able to mentor the people who are coming behind us. And this is a great way to do it. I got to give you props for that. Yeah, absolutely. Is that, is that your final thought? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Come on, give us a little more, Tracy. I, sorry. <laughs> No, I, I believe that's it. I, you know, it's it's not the same way it was 10 or 15 years ago. It is a competitive market. There, like I said, it, entry into the conference field uh, it can be really difficult if you think you don't have a name or a new idea, yeah. or as was said in the previous segment, right? Uh, oh, it's all been done before. It hasn't. You may have a new take. The science may right. be new. The citations are different. You have a, a new viewpoint or new experience. But until you put that abstract in or you put your experience out there, you're never going to know. This is one way 
website to just get your name or face or network out with people who have that background and can give you a push up. Even if, even if you don't win Stand and Deliver, they can give you really valuable input or advice. Right. And for six years now, uh, we've walked away mentoring people through article submission, regional conferences, local, local opportunities that helped push their careers further or got new information out there. We got really good uh, results each year awesome. from across the country. Awesome. I'm glad you're here, and I want to thank you for sharing that with us. Let's go ahead and take another quick break. Rob and I will come back, and we'll give you our final thoughts on EMS Expo 2024. Chris, that was a fantastic interview uh, with Tracy and uh, last year's winner, Rebecca Carmody, who's actually from uh, Las Vegas, is here yeah. uh, not only speaking at the conference, but actually she's one of this year's judges. Oh, very good. And so it's an opportunity to come back and, and judge as well. So that's fantastic. But so great show. But I'll let you tell everybody to like and subscribe. Watch us on video. Watch us on YouTube. Listen to us where you get your channels and then take, take us home. I think that Rob just said it all. I think though. I did, so, actually. Yeah, so for the EMS One Stop, for Inside EMS, for Kelly Grayson, I'm Chris Sabalero. Don't forget to subscribe. If you want to go ahead and send us your comments, your concerns, you can do it at the show at EMS1.com, and we'll certainly share any emails that come in with Rob as well if you want to give him some suggestions about the EMS One Stop. Otherwise, we'll see everyone again next week. See you next week.